In Portland, Maine, a beautiful young woman vanishes one night while out on the town. We have no crime scene. We have no body. Is she alive or dead? It was unusual that a young lady goes missing from a nightclub downtown Portland and is never seen again. Desperate, the top detective turns to a psychic for help. And immediately, when he started talking, she was right there. Can the psychic's mysterious visions help police to find Amy? Help them find me, help them find me, help them get me out. Portland, Maine, a peaceful city in historic New England. But on October 21st, 2001, that peace was shattered. Amy St. Laurent, a 25-year-old administrative assistant and Portland native, disappears into the night. Amy was charming, fun-loving, and according to everyone, reliable. Amy's a responsible young woman who didn't turn up for work on Monday not prone to disappearing and not getting her cat fed and leaving her personal belongings behind. I miss her, I want her back. Anything anyone can do to help would be really appreciated. It wasn't just her family who were desperate to find Amy. The entire city was looking for her. Portland is a small city. Everybody was aware of it. Amy's picture uh, was everywhere. I mean, you couldn't walk a block without seeing her photograph. Deputy Chief Joe Lachlan of the Portland Police is in charge of a team of detectives working the case. It was unusual that a young lady goes missing from a nightclub downtown Portland and is never seen again. I mean, she just basically disappears. And there are no answers. The public's demanding answers. And one of our best reporters went downtown. And the family was hanging up posters with her picture. And they were visibly distraught. And I think everybody just couldn't believe what was going on, and their hearts just went out to, to the family. What police know is that at the Pavilion nightclub, Amy became separated from her friend around midnight. Though he searches, he can't find her in the crowded club. Frustrated, he leaves. After that, she vanishes. Portland police continue their search for Amy San Laurent, the 25 year old administrator. Lieutenant Lachlan is feeling the heat. He has to find Amy, but has few leads. And police are asking anyone with information to come forward. We had zip, we had nothing. Um, we had some speculation, conjecture. We have no crime scene, uh, we have no body, uh, we have no physical evidence. Five days after Amy disappeared, driving into police headquarters, Lachlan tunes in a voice on his car radio. Q97.9, this is Vicki Monroe with Spirit Messenger. It is a moment that will change the course of the investigation. Hi, Vicki, my name's Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Jackie, has your mother and father passed? Uh, yes, both my parents have died. At radio station Q97.9 in downtown Portland, psychic Vicki Monroe is hosting her weekly call-in show. She's helping listeners connect, so she says, with their dead loved ones. I see them very clearly defined. Um, I hear them, and I also get a sensation of whatever they're feeling or how they might have passed. Your parents are both fine, alive and well, as they put it on the other side. Um, your mother it says, though, that you were there when she passed. Actually, I was. And were you holding her hand? I was. And did you tell her it was OK to go? I did. OK. So as I'm listening to the radio, I said, you know what? I'm going to call this woman when I get to work and, and see if she can tell me where Amy is. Can a psychic radio show host really help a cop find a missing woman? Why not? Why not? My frame of mind is, Perhaps this can trigger some thought process in me, some further inquiry to the detectives, some, some information that we may not have thought about. Joe Lachlan, I'm a lieutenant at the Portland Police Department. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps you can help me with something. Have you heard of the Amy St. Lauren case? Lieutenant Lachlan's phone call triggers an extraordinary reaction. I was shaking. I know that I started to cry. It was last seen at one of the nightclubs called the Pavilion. But I was just so stunned shocked and, and really ex surprised because he's telling me about this missing person who then just starts to appear right in front of my face. There is a person coming in and... She came right through for me. 
Immediately, Vicky gets a powerful image of Amy. Well, she's exclaiming that her name is Amy. Gray sweatshirt, writing on the side. I kept asking her, what does that say? And she said, Pratt Whitney. And that was where she worked at the time. He, okay. For the psychic, it can mean only one thing. Okay, JJ, okay. My first response was that that sick feeling in my stomach always usually happens when I know somebody's passed away. So immediately there was a feeling of, or a sense of, this girl's past. Monroe tells Lachlan Amy is dead. And then she goes a step farther. I knew this is a murder case. And he's really not prepared for what she tells him next. Okay, she keeps repeating, Amy's repeating, JJJ is definitely the name of the man that killed me. In Portland, Maine, 25-year-old Amy St. Laurent has been missing for five days. Is she alive? Has she been abducted? Where is she? The police are stumped. Desperate for clues, Lieutenant Joe Lachlan asks Vicki Monroe, a local radio personality and psychic, for help. Monroe has a terrifying vision of Amy. She's dead, the victim of a brutal murder, and something more. I saw Amy. She described the gentleman. His name is Jeff. Jeff. It was definitely the name of the man that killed me. Jeff, 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 Jeff. That's what Amy's saying. And he killed her. She got into a vehicle with... New evidence has revealed that the last person to see Amy was a man by the name of Jeff, Jeff Gorman. No one but the police has that information. I mean, it was uncanny. It was, it was uncanny information, no doubt. It starts a conversation, it starts a dialogue, it starts rethinking, it starts discussion and argument, which is good for the case, because that's what we constantly do. Most cases start with a crime scene and some place to start. Here, we are trying to find a starting place. And ultimately, we found that starting place with uh, Jeffrey Russell Gorman. While Lieutenant Lachlan heads up the investigation, two veteran detectives lead the search for Amy. Scott Heracles from Maine State Police and Danny Young from Portland PD. Gorman was just the last person known to be with Amy St. Laurent. And at that point, we had to focus on him until we could either clear him or put the case together. Gorman is hauled in. As he is questioned, Lachlan watches for signs of deception if the psychic is right, this man knows what happened to Amy. Where was this guy then, Eric? Was he around? I don't know. She said that he left her. Gorman, who wanted to appear very cooperative, was in fact very reluctant. He would come and give you his story, but he wouldn't do anything further. I play a lot of pool. Under close questioning by Detective Young, Gorman freely admits meeting Amy at the Pavilion nightclub and taking her to a party at his friend's apartment. There were three people, herself included. They got in the car. I think that she left with Jeffrey Gorman. Uh, number one, she couldn't find her, her friend at the time. Two, Gorman knows a lot of people in a position of authority and uh, bouncers and bar persons and things of that nature. So she might have felt that uh, ephemeral safety with him. According to Gorman, Amy doesn't stay long at the party and he drives her back downtown. I pulled up. I did not even put my car in park. Left in drove. She says, I hope you remember my name. I'll call you tomorrow. All right. But Gorman's story doesn't stack up. Across the street from the pavilion is a jewelry store. So they had a video camera that basically shot out through the glass into the road. We knew what Gorman had for a car, so we looked at the tapes for that time period, and Gorman's car never appeared. Um, so that clearly indicates to us that he's lying. At the time, he also says that there's a lot of activity here, that bouncers um, and persons are coming and going from the nightclub. We know that at that time of night that this place is a ghost town. Police dig into Gorman's background. They find a criminal history that stretches all the way to Florida. His record included a lot of uh, misdemeanor crimes and, and thefts and crimes of dishonesty. 
knowing his background going into Florida and Alabama and talking to the uh, individual detectives and people down there. And uh, we got the picture of Russ Gorman, uh, Jeffrey Gorman, as someone we, we didn't want, we didn't trust. And nothing that he said, uh, not, nothing that he said we could, uh, could verify. Yeah, they did. Um, before leaving, after leaving the pavilion... Gorman's suspicious behavior after the interview raises other red flags. He has a, you know, a piece of crap car that he never cleans, that he's driving around in, that his friend said a couple of days earlier, why don't you clean this thing up? And he says, oh, it's a piece of junk. I'm not, there's no sense cleaning this car up. And the day after Amy was missing, that car was cleaned up and it was immaculate. He starts changing his appearance. He shaves his head. He gets body pierces and tattoos. Um, he's, he's making all sorts of inquiries about polygraph and dealing with the police. He refuses to cooperate with us. He was indicating all sorts of what we call post-offense behavior. And we start building a case, um, starting with the fact that he never dropped her off. So we, we've lost a little bit of time in there. I don't know where he went, what he was doing. Jeff Gorman is now suspect number one in the disappearance of Amy St. Laurent, just as psychic Vicky Monroe predicted. I don't know if he was back. And it was definitely Jeff. That is the name they had to go with. Hey, and I see it, yes, I see it. But the psychic has even more powerful visions. Amy is showing Vicky where they can find her. Then she shows me this area. It was wooded, very, very wooded. I can hear water. There's water. I, I could hear water. She also described that there was a house nearby that was significant to this Jeff person. Police know Jeff Gorman often stays at his mother's house, located outside Portland in a heavily wooded area. New evidence shows he was close by the night Amy disappeared. He was stopped by police for a broken headlight at 2.45 in the morning. He could only possibly travel in a small radius based on all the information that we had gathered. Mm -hmm. yes, this isn't too far from where he no. was stopped. We established criteria for search areas. One of the areas is right near Gorman's mother's house where he lived. We believe that Amy could be somewhere in that area. Could this area be the dense woodland Monroe sees in her visions? It's six weeks since Amy vanished. There was a huge amount of pressure on the police to solve this crime. First, because we didn't know if this would happen again to another young woman in the old port and uh, also just for her family to know that there was some resolution. But at that time, it was just Gorman and Cush. Uh, this is at the... Uh... The detectives became very attached to her. And in fact, um, at one point, because of who she was, they were referring to her as our Amy. Amy was too sweet a girl. She was too good a person. So many of our cases, we're able to reason some of these things away. We still work very hard, but you can reason a lot away so you don't have to take a lot home with you that night. But Amy never left. She came home every night. Lieutenant Lachlan actually asked me um, if I would speak to a woman named Diane Jenkins. Well, the names didn't match, so I honestly didn't know who that would be. And uh, it ended up being Amy's mom. Uh, Diane came with me and she had a bag with her. And it contained a book and pictures. It was definitely confirmation for me that that, that, uh, that was Amy. That was the girl that I had seen. Mrs. Jenkins, what I do is I see people that have passed away and I can see Amy and she's right behind you. The vividness of, of Amy was very intense. And this time was gonna show herself in complete form right down to her tattoo and her sandals, so her mother would know, this is me. Don't even question this. This is me. She's wearing a gray... It was very important that I relay the message to her mother that I love you, you were a wonderful mother, you were all of these great things to me. I felt sad, but I also felt great relief in the respect that her mother knows at least this much that she's okay, and she's not suffering. But 
But now detectives face another obstacle, Mother Nature. Um, we had conducted many, many searches, uh, and this was our last big effort. Police need to work fast. It's early December, and heavy snowfall is in the forecast. As we started the search in the morning, you know, we were all um, very anxious to get moving because snow was coming. Snow was imminent. It was going to happen that day. The snow may have prevented the cadaver dogs from actually indicating on the grave, which then would have been a whole another four or five months. Urgency really sums up uh, how we were feeling. We had to find her. Danny and Scott really believed that, that we were going to find her. I was just like, well, man, I don't know how we're going to do it. You know, it's just uh, the proverbial needle in a haystack. Just as Monroe predicted, police now believe the answer to the mystery of Amy's disappearance lies buried in these woods. Uh, this is very, very familiar territory to Jeffrey Russ Gorman. Uh, his mother's house is through the woods here, probably about four tenths of a mile. Uh, these trails he's been through many, many, many times. He's fished these ponds. If you look over here, you can see probably 50 feet from us is water. For hours, police scour the woods, and then... Around 2.30 uh, in the afternoon, the, the search team uh, was walking through this area, and they stepped on an area over here where the earth was soft and determined that it didn't feel right. They backed up, and they looked, and they noticed some uh, depression, soft earth, fresh shovel marks. Could this be what they were looking for? The dogs first come through here, and they go immediately to this pine tree here, and they alert on the pine tree. From here, they go to this area where there, there was a grave. Detective Young takes charge of the crime scene. I had taken some tools from my, from my vehicle and, uh, and dug down a little bit and searched, and I could feel um, basically an arm or I could feel skin underneath. The forensic dig continues late into the night. But is it Amy's body they have found? Has the psychic been right all along? You need to help me get out. Help them find me, help them find me, help them get me out. It's December 8th, 2001. For the past six weeks, Finding Amy St. Laurent has consumed the police in Portland, Maine. Amy is the type of, of uh, daughter you'd be proud to have. And I had a daughter, Amy, the same age. Um, it, it hit home, hit very, very close to home. Amy is the kind of victim, she's the kind of person we're supposed to protect. She's the reason we come to work. Then we had to do, get it done for her. Now they may be close. Psychic Vicki Monroe described where to look for her body. I see a house, there's a house, there's a house, there's water. I, I could hear water. It's Jeff. She Jeff, also told Jeff, police Jeff. the name of the person responsible. The gentleman that did this to her was Jeff. Jeff Gorman is the chief suspect in the investigation, but the psychic knows even more. And then Amy told me that um, I'm under something. I can't get out. What does she mean? Police are about to find out. When we're doing uh, the forensic exhumation, I do remember finding the uh, piece of plywood. And uh, what Vicki had told me resonated at that point that she was under something. And when the plywood is removed, a gray Pratt & Whitney sweatshirt, as seen in Monroe's vision, emerges from the damp, dark soil. At that point, we know, we know that we had Amy. From the moment we confirmed, it was very surreal. We were on autopilot immediately. I don't think we needed to sleep again for a couple of days. It was really, it was invigorating and a little bit of relief. It's an emotional moment. A relief, and yet it confirms everyone's worst fear. 
I think probably the, the most difficult part of this case is uh, the day we discovered Amy and um, finding her remains and, and going through the forensic dig and exhumation. You know, you have this image of a young lady who had her whole life ahead of her, and, um, you know, seeing that crime scene was, was very difficult for all of us. In the moments that we found her, we got our first snowstorm of the season. Yep, yep, we were. Leaving the site when the snow started coming down, and it was a substantial storm, too. We all were just amazed that if it was another day, we never would have found her. And Vicki Monroe had told me that she would be found before the first snow. And I could see it on television, where they had found Amy and what she was wearing. I, I do this for a living. This shouldn't be a shock. I thought, oh, my God. How could Vicki Monroe have known so much about this terrible case? Did the spirit of Amy really tell her? Vicki said Amy had been murdered. She said the killer was named Jeff. She predicted he buried Amy under something near water close to a familiar house. She even knew about the gray sweatshirt. I don't uh, know how she could possibly have known any of this information. I don't know if it's just something that I carried with me since I was born. Some people will say I'm cursed, and I say no. This isn't a curse. I feel blessed. I can't explain it. Uh, I think human beings um, have uh, six senses, or I know that I watch detectives develop another sense, another level of, of uh, intellect or observation, and perhaps that's true. Whatever the truth behind Monroe's extraordinary insights, the information she passed to police played an important role in finding Amy and her killer. I think the, the biggest impact that her statements had on the investigation is that it stimulates conversation, it stimulates discussion, and, and that begets other information. One day after Amy is found, police arrest Jeffrey Gorman and charge him with first-degree murder. At his trial, the terrible details of Amy's last night alive are revealed. We will not know precisely what happened that night, uh, but we believe that the assault started in the car. After leaving the party, Gorman stops and forces himself on Amy. She resists and he brutally assaults her. He then takes a gun out and brings her to familiar ground. I believe Amy was taken up this road by force. Hidden in the forest, under the cover of night, Gorman assaults and rapes Amy. Then, by a pine tree, he shoots her in the head. Two days later, he returns to bury her next to the pond, covered by a cheap piece of plywood. I often tell people that uh, this is an unbelievable case. It was an unbelievable experience. It takes a lot out of you and pushes you against the wall. And I don't know how many times you can really handle that in a career, a case like this, one that you cannot afford to lose. And there's no doubt in my mind that this man would kill again. This guy is serial sexual homicide. In court, Gorman's own dark words finally seal his fate. Prosecutors present a recording of Gorman's mother admitting to police that her son had confessed to her that he killed Amy. A brutal killer is found guilty and sentenced to 60 years in prison for the murder of Amy St. Laurent. Now that we have Jeffrey Russ Gorman behind bars, he will never be able to kill again. And this, to me, is, is sacred ground.